Good afternoon and welcome to our latest Milwaukee Press Club virtual newsmaker event. I am Gene Miller of News Radio 620 WTMJ and I am also the Press Club president, at least for another month. Welcome aboard and thanks for spending your lunch hour with us. Our guest today is Senator Tammy Baldwin, but first we need to take care of some business, some thank yous. We want to thank our presenting sponsor, that being Spectrum News One, as well as our sustaining sponsor, Miller Koss, and our event partners, WizPolitics.com and the Rotary Club of Milwaukee. WizPolitics.com partners with the Press Club for this luncheon as part of its ongoing event series in Milwaukee that's sponsored by UW Milwaukee, the Wisconsin Academy of Global Education and Training, 1125 at Pabst, the Milwaukee Police Association, the Firm Consulting, and the Medical College of Wisconsin as well as Spectrum. Our panel of journalists, uh, journalists today that will be doing the questioning, Charles Benson of today's TMJ4, Jeff Mayers of wispolitics.com, and Adrian Pedersen of WISN Channel 12. As always, our virtual tip jar is out there too. If you'd like to contribute to help sustain our mission, our program, Shrink Milwaukee Press Club, just click on the link in milwaukeepressclub.org and we'd be more than happy to take your donation because uh, it does take a little bit of money to run this place. And, uh, we'd appreciate anything you could do. Our guest today, again, is Senator Tammy Baldwin, a native of Madison, Wisconsin, a UW Law School graduate, former member of the Wisconsin Assembly, the state's first female member of Congress winning election to the House in 1998, elected to the Senate in 2012, and re-elected in 2018. Serves on several committees, including the Senate's Appropriations Committee, as well as the Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions, and the Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Senator Tammy Baldwin. Well, thank you, Gene, and I want to thank the Milwaukee Press Club for hosting this. Uh, glad that we can all still get together, even if it is virtually. Um, as you uh, heard, I am right now in Washington, D.C., where we are uh, working on uh, crafting and negotiating uh, a fourth uh, COVID-19 relief package. And uh, that work has uh, begun really in earnest uh, this week after Mitch McConnell on Monday uh, presented his plan, the Republican plan, um, and I just wanted to say a couple words about uh, where we are and where we've come uh, before we get into the Q&A, maybe even anticipating what some of your questions might be. Um, we are in the end of July. The pandemic came to the U.S. at the end of January. This many months into the pandemic, we are going in the wrong direction in terms of the spread of the disease, and, uh, and, and I look at it as an utter failure, failure of leadership on the part of this administration. The actions that still haven't been taken, had they been taken at the beginning, would have put us in a much, much different place without having 4 million uh, testing positive and uh, 150,000 deaths, uh, we passed that number, that milestone uh, just today. So I wanted to just uh, say that uh, uh, Mitch McConnell's plan falls short in many uh, respects. I'm sure we'll detail that uh, later, but as people uh, face a cliff with regard to unemployment insurance, as state and local governments struggle to provide essential services with reduced revenues, and as people by the millions across this country lose their health care, um, none of those issues are adequately addressed in the bill before us. So we are negotiating as hard as we can to meet the needs of American families and Wisconsin families and workers uh, during this pandemic. With that, I'll uh, 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 close off my opening comments and look forward to your questions. Let's let the questions begin with Charles Benson. Uh, Senator, good to see you. Thank you for making time. As you know, the CARES Act provided $600 a week in unemployment insurance. Uh, and I believe under the HEROES Act, House Democrats wanted to continue that under the current HEALS Act that's being moved forward in the Senate. They're looking to drop that down to about 200 a week and then a formula that would provide about 70% of what uh, people are making. So 
is $600 um, firm and strong for you or is there wiggle room? Is the negotiation around the $600 a week number? Well, let me first state uh, that um, the HEROES Act, as you know, was passed in mid-May. And uh, they in the House saw that there was this cliff coming and voted to extend these unemployment benefits in light of our economic and pandemic circumstances through the end of January of next year. I have no earthly understanding why it took Mitch McConnell uh, to the week prior to the cliff uh, to come in and then with a proposal that doesn't extend um, but radically changes it, especially when we get to October. I know that from the discussions that we've had with both Wisconsin Unemployment Insurance uh, administrators as well as other states across the country, that when they get it down to that individual calculation come October, that it is technically uh, or technologically not feasible for most state systems. These are systems that were programmed in languages like COBALT that we learned in college. Not uh, it, and, and so they have said, we cannot implement a person by person calculation given the IT systems that we have. Even changing the flat level from 600 to 200 for many is going to be a laborious process that may take weeks. Certainly, I, um, I am willing to look at uh, a, a flat level. The individual calculation is a no-go because it's just not gonna work. And uh, if we keep the full stimulus payment, uh, direct payment, um, I think we can have a negotiation uh, about uh, what level uh, it should be. I'd certainly support $600, uh, but uh, I don't think that that is uh, a, a line that's been drawn that we can't negotiate, uh, uh, you know, a little bit around the dollar amount. If I could just follow up on that, because in this conversation about um, whether or not uh, people have been disincentivized to go back to work because in some cases, the $600 a week uh, allows them to earn more than what they were earning when they were at work. So when you look at the metrics of how should someone be uh, paid with unemployment benefits, what is the best metric to say, this is fair for employee A, and this is what would be fair for employee B, instead of saying everyone gets the same amount on the federal level? Yes, well, again, I, I, let's just look at the impact of the enhanced uh, unemployment uh, benefit, uh, PUA, pandemic unemployment assistance. Um, we have kept many, many families out of poverty. Had they been uh, without a federal supplement to their unemployment insurance, they would have fallen into poverty because of the pandemic and no fault of their own. Additionally, the uh, spending capacity that it has given uh, families have uh, allowed people to still um, uh, purchase things and keep other aspects of the economy going. Um, it has kept people in homes uh, and uh, in, in apartments. And so it has had a stimulative effect on the economy. In other words, our economy would be much worse if it weren't for the uh, supplemental pandemic uh, assistance. I think when we passed that bill, we thought that we would have bent the curve, flattened the curve on this pandemic, but it's clear uh, that we have not and the cases are growing at this time. And so we have to look longer term. With regard to the rules of collecting unemployment insurance, one rule still stands, and that is that you, if you are offered a job and you refuse it, you are off unemployment insurance. So I've heard concerns raised by employers um, that this could be a disincentive into going back to work. But again, the, uh, if an employer calls back a former employee and they say no, um, they will no longer be entitled to unemployment insurance benefits. So there's no incentive for them to say no. 
The only rule that was really relaxed was the job search activities. So while you're on unemployment insurance in most uh, circumstances, you have an active duty to go out, get your resume, uh, do interviews, apply for jobs. And during a pandemic, that is not uh, practicable. So that was relaxed, but that was really the only rule that was relaxed. Okay, I think uh, I'll take over now. This is Jeff Mayers. And uh, thanks very much for doing this uh, Milwaukee Press Club Wiz Politics event. I really appreciate it. Uh, so the other big uh, news of the day, uh, I think, is uh, Joe Biden's going to be picking his vice presidential choice. And you're on a lot of lists. And because, uh, hey, you won the state in double digit fashion, a purple state uh, and during your last reelection, what, what would you bring to the ticket? Well, first of all, my interactions with the Biden campaign and with um, uh, Vice President Biden himself was really in large part focused on what lessons we learned in 2018 uh, when I was running for re-election and uh, what happened in 2016 that accounted for a very narrow Trump victory in the state of Wisconsin. And so um, I've had the honor of, of sort of providing that counsel to the vice president and to uh, the campaign uh, ever since. Um, I, uh, I will tell you that I am looking forward to hearing the announcement next week. It is coming, uh, it is coming very shortly. Uh, I, I won't have to tiptoe around any more questions about what's happening uh, after that. Um, but it was certainly an honor to appear on those lists, and I will do anything I can to make sure that uh, Joe Biden becomes our next president. So how do you like your chances? <laughs> um, uh, I, I'm looking forward to the announcement next week. <laughs> all right. No more tiptoeing, though. All right. All right. On to Adrian. Hey, Senator. Thank you for answering some of our questions today. Another piece of news, the Department of Justice had a press conference saying that the federal agents coming to Milwaukee will not be the same as what we've been seeing in Portland clashing with protesters. I'm wondering how confident are you that this will truly be a partnership that's focusing on crime? Well, I had a chance to talk with our uh, U.S. Attorney in the Eastern District of Wisconsin, Matt Krieger, uh, earlier, and I uh, I, I was very concerned about uh, reports of uh, federal uh, Department of Justice uh, agencies uh, coming in uh, because it was announced essentially at the same time that people were watching their televisions and seeing these very disturbing clashes in uh, Portland, Oregon, and before that, uh, Lafayette Square across from the White House. Um, and I was pleased that, uh, that the U.S. Attorney uh, Krieger clarified uh, for me uh, in our telephone call the, the mission and the constraints on, on, on this mission. I also joined uh, fellow uh, Wisconsin elected officials in um, writing to uh, uh, U.S. Attorney Krieger uh, so that we can get some of these clarifications in writing. And I'm glad that he has uh, appeared uh, at a press conference to outline those things. What I'm angry about is that, uh, that uh, Attorney General uh, Barr uh, and the Trump administration never reached out to any of the uh, uh, congressional or statewide elected officials in Wisconsin to give us a heads up in this announcement. And so as all of us were watching these horrific scenes of uh, tear gassing and pepper spray and, uh, and, and very aggressive uh, uh, policing in, uh, in Portland and as I said, in other sites, um, it was very disturbing to hear uh, without uh, any warning uh, that the feds were coming to Wisconsin, if you will. So I'm glad that there's been some clarification and we wanna keep apprised uh, uh, very, um, very uh, frequently uh, of what that mission is looking like. After getting this clarification, do you feel more comfortable 
with this operation coming to Milwaukee? Yes, it appears to be um, the agencies uh, working together more closely uh, to uh, deal with a very significant uptick in, uh, in crime, especially homicide. And uh, I think that that is uh, an important cooperation and collaboration uh, that, that needs to happen. These will primarily be investigators and not uh, folks who will be uh, in uniform on the street in any way. Uh, so, right, Senator, Charles. a little bit more on that, because there has been this confusion because we've seen what's happened in Portland and what the intent use was there. And people seem to say, oh, look what happened there. That's what's going to be happening here. And when you hear that clarification and when you hear from the U.S. Uh, attorney, are, are you now supporting what is now called Operation Legend and the efforts to address getting, you know, drugs and guns and violent criminals off the streets as what they are claiming this operation will do. Yeah, the, the collaboration between the federal agencies like the um, ATF and the DEA and the FBI um, is something that always goes on, but this is sort of uh, uh, creating a greater collaboration on pretty much the investigative side of, uh, of crime. And I, I am supportive as described, but I did tell the U.S. attorney uh, in our conversation um, that the public relations that they really need to do on this, and it should have come from the U.S. Department of Justice and the Trump administration, but now it falls on us to be really clear. So I'm glad that he had a press conference to uh, clarify things this morning. I didn't get a chance to watch it, but I understand he did. Um, and that, that clarity will have to continue. And I will say one other thing uh, that we discussed is um, and, and we may talk about this on this call too, that uh, because the Democratic National Convention is uh, happening uh, in part in person in Milwaukee as well as virtually, um, there is uh, security uh, associated with the convention. And I think that too needs to be understood to be there for a very specific purpose, which is to uh, uh, make sure that the business of the Democratic National Convention can be successfully completed. Okay, I'll pick up on the DNC thing. Uh, this is Jeff again. Um, you know, it's greatly d diminished. Uh, what was going to be 50,000 people might be 300 or less. Um, and, you know, are you going to attend? What are you telling, uh, you know, fellow senators and fellow politicos? Should they attend? And what are your hopes and aspirations for a convention that just isn't going to be what everybody hoped? Well, I am planning on, to, on, on attending. Uh, I am looking forward to having the vice president in Wisconsin to accept his nomination. Uh, and I am looking forward uh, as uh, in my role as an honorary member of the host committee to uh, welcoming de uh, the delegates who do come and other participants who do come. Uh, to Milwaukee and to Wisconsin. Um, I do believe that the uh, DNC and the Biden campaign have put the health and safety of all participants front and center, first and foremost. And in stark contrast to the campaign activities of, uh, of, of President Trump, um, where there's been very, uh, uh, you know, a lot of uh, crowded spaces and and uh, and uh, maskless individuals, et cetera, uh, and uh, not really following any sort of public health advice. So I'm glad uh, that they're doing that because the health and safety of participants and Milwaukee community at large comes first. And I think the people who will be watching every night on television understand that to be the case. Yet we have business to do. Uh, we have a, a, a presidential uh, nominee to nominate. We have a platform. We have all sorts of uh, business to conduct, as well as the ability, uh, uh, both virtually and in person, to highlight uh, Milwaukee and Wisconsin, because um, we do know that the road to the White House goes right through our state. 
one quick follow up to that. Do you think Milwaukee should get a, a, another chance at this, given all this craziness this year? Like a, in a future presidential year, Milwaukee can get another chance. You know, maybe. I maybe. am all for that. I am all for that. <laughs> okay, on to you, Adrian. Thank you, Jeff. I wanted to circle back a little bit about the stimulus package and just ask you if you have any kind of timeline for us because people are very concerned about what their future holds, understandably so. What's the timeline on when this could get done? Yeah, well, and I kind of uh, glossed over in, in introductory comments on, on how, fall, how far short this uh, proposal of Mitch McConnell's falls. So uh, the uh, lack of uh, continuation of robust unemployment insurance is very notable. The lack of funding for Medicaid when we have so many people who have lost their insurance, again, no fault of their own. The issues with uh, there being zero dollars uh, allocated for local and state governments that have seen their revenues uh, reduced significantly because of the pandemic and are struggling to be able to afford to provide the basic essential services plus the extra services they're providing in fighting this pandemic. Um, the educational uh, focus falls really short, especially when the very same administration is pushing so hard for schools to reopen in person five days a week. Uh, and so there's, there's a lot that is, um, that is missing. Um, what I will tell you is there's a huge amount of disarray within the Republican Party. Right now, it is said that Mitch McConnell does not have a vote, enough votes within his own uh, caucus to pass what he proposed on Monday. And so negotiations Ooh, are people could get forward. some. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize. I think there was a delay there. I didn't mean to cut you off. But any idea when there could be some relief for people when the two sides maybe could come together on this? Yeah, well, um, the scheduled session goes through the end of next week. And so uh, things have a way of beginning to resolve uh, when we get close to uh, a, a time of the schedule coming to an end. Um, and there are now some really significant negotiations underway, particularly between the uh, administration uh, represented by Mark Meadows and Steve Mnuchin and uh, also uh, Leader Schumer and Speaker Pelosi. So uh, those have been intense since the beginning of the week. And I hope we can begin to hear about headway. I know that um, there's a lot of priorities that I have for the measure that are not included in Mitch McConnell's plan. And I think I feel are essential to our getting, um, uh, responding more effectively to this pandemic. All right, Charles. Um, let me ask you about Operation Warp Speed. And that is the effort to try to get a vaccine, and as you know, it is moving along uh, quite fast with some having the expectation that we would have some sort of vaccine uh, by the beginning of next year. Uh, given that, what sort of concerns, what level of confidence do you have that while the process is being sped up, uh, that come next year, that the vaccine, if it is proven to work, should be given to people and would your level of confidence be that you would be one of the first in line to get the vaccine? Uh, I, I certainly hope not. Uh, so let's um, talk generally about Operation Warp Speed. I'm on the oversight committee for the department. So I've gotten um, some uh, great briefings. Um, a typical vaccine takes between 15 and 20 years to develop. Think about that, 15 to 20 years. Um, so this is warp speed if we're talking about the prospect of a uh, vaccine uh, by early next year. Um, there's about 155 vaccine prospects out there, or at least uh, companies that are, um, are, are uh, putting forth uh, prospects. Uh, what warp speed decided to do was whittle that down to the most promising candidates, 
Um, and with that, they decided to um, do something that is really risky, but, um, but also important, um, which is called manufacturing at risk. Meaning they're picking, uh, right now I think they're at five uh, hopeful uh, prospects that while they're doing their phase three trials, which is sort of the last big trial you do with 30,000 or more uh, people, um, that they are manufacturing doses of that vaccine as they do it. The risk is that it won't be effective and they will have manufactured uh, and, and there'll be no use for them. But the, if you don't do that and you find uh, that the vaccine is uh, uh, useful and, and is effective, um, you don't want to have to wait another six months or more uh, to ramp up the manufacturing of it. So they, they reduce the number of, of uh, vaccine prospects that they're doing this with. Um, but right now, I think we're up to about five. And... Um, and each of them can uh, manufacture you know, a, a, at least 100 million doses. Uh, they're preparing things like uh, syringes and, and vials, depending on the product and figuring out, of course, what the appropriate dosing is. Um, so that's a key piece of it. What we have not yet seen and what we've been pressing for is that question you asked at the end who gets in line first? And uh, I think that uh, because they will not have enough doses on day one for uh, all the people in the United States, that they have, uh, that they're putting together uh, a sort of priority list that has to do with uh, the level of vulnerability uh, and uh, especially I think for first responders and healthcare workers uh, so that we uh, take care of the workforce that is taking care of those uh, who are affected by COVID-19. So let me ask you then if I could just follow up on that uh, because uh, you describe what is going on and, uh, and describe it as the risk that we're taking right now. But these are unprecedented times and there yes. does seem to be uh, you know, technology has changed, medicine has changed. Are you raising the red flag that we are going too fast or we need to see what those results will be before we decide who should get in line first? No, I support this approach. And frankly, I will tell you that it's the same approach that I was pushing for from the very beginning of this pandemic with regard to things like PPE, the, the face masks, the gloves, the, the gowns for healthcare workers. Um, what I was pushing for, for testing um, and testing supplies and reagents. If we had have taken the Operation Warp Speed approach to everything we needed to flatten the curve starting in February or January or March or April or May or June, it's on the end of July. And I'm so furious with the failure of leadership of President Trump and this administration, we should, I think warp speed right now is one of the few things that they're getting right. They're doing things uh, uh, that uh, do speed up uh, and, and do focus on having some domestic access, not just relying on things that are produced overseas, knowing that the pandemic is worldwide and uh, our inability to produce some of these things in the US has been part of the problem. And President Trump could change that all, all of it. So given what you know now, just one more follow up on that. Um, do you hope to be one of the first in line to get the shot or the vaccine? Uh, you know, uh, I, I do not. Um, and the only reason is that um, at this point I have been uh, teleworking Welcome to my DC apartment. I have been wearing masks. Uh, the only time that I have significant interactions with others is uh, when I go to vote on the Senate floor uh, because it is, uh, we still haven't figured out a way to conduct our votes and our business remotely. Um, uh, so, uh, but we're, we're 
exercising care and uh, I don't think I'm one of the most more vulnerable people. I certainly want to see my, uh, my, my friends and constituents who are in the front lines in hospitals and nursing homes, uh, uh, in assisted living facilities. I want to see them uh, get a much higher priority. We will see a plan ultimately. We just haven't seen it yet on what the priority for uh, vaccination will be. All right, this is uh, Jeff again. And uh, going back to the, the pending bill that's uh, going to be before Congress, hopefully soon, uh, beyond uh, the, keeping a flat uh, unemployment, the federal unemployment benefit because of the pandemic, what other priorities do you have? I know that you've talked about agriculture and workplace protection and uh, supply chain for PPE. I mean, are those the kind of things that will be part of this bill? Because when you have a big bill, I guess it's the uh, time to, to hang on some Christmas ornaments and some things that need to be done, right? Yeah, and I don't consider any of those three things you listed to be Christmas ornaments. These are the things we should have done at the very beginning of the pandemic. Or, and, and if we had, we wouldn't have been in the situation we see now of the um, coronavirus uh, cases, uh, uh, you know, spiking again. And uh, so the, let's start with the uh, Every Worker Protection Act. Um, we have a Department of Labor at the federal level. Um, they have an agency called the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Their job is to uh, promote safety uh, and well being at workplaces. And when a pandemic hits, and there are people who are considered essential workers, it's up to them to uh, issue standards of how you do the best you possibly can to keep those workers safe. I'm still hearing reports in Wisconsin of nurses who have been asked to wear uh, masks for a full week. They're rationed. Uh, this is, um, you know, people are trying to uh, disinfect uh, N95 masks. Again, we're in the end of July uh, and we don't have a federal agency who's issued standards. All we have is, is voluntary guidelines. Um, so that to me is an essential piece of it uh, because all of these other things we're talking about don't matter if we don't, uh, if our workers aren't alive, right? And I, I hate to be that uh, extreme about it, but it's so true. Then the um, medical supply chain issues, uh, I, I already referred to those, but um, I have a bill called the Medical Supply Transparency and Delivery Act, which would take the sort of Operation Warp Speed uh, approach that they're taking with vaccines, but you, to apply those to other things that are needed to fight this pandemic, like masks, like the testing equipment, swabs and reagents, like uh, other medical equipment needed to fight this pandemic. And then uh, in terms of our agricultural economy, <clears throat> one of the things that I don't think ever was anticipated um, in terms of emergency planning is the idea that uh, the economy would shut down so that that part of our ag economy that uh, their customers are uh, buying in bulk uh, restaurants, restaurant chains, uh, corporate cafeterias, uh, school cafeterias, um, that they would, th that demand would just totally drop off. And yet the food pantries and the consumers using grocery stores are finding bare shelves because we have bifurcated our, our food processing, right? Some for the big folks and some for the individuals. And so it created a crisis that wasn't foreseen and none of the ag uh, programs really address that sort of supply chain set of issues that have been so injurious to uh, crop farmers, livestock farmers, dairy farmers. Um, my uh, uh, farmers, farmer support to states uh, measure would help uh, eliminate those logistical uh, 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 problems that are just decimating our uh, ag sector. 
And so another one I forgot to mention is state and local. Uh, yes. aid. Uh, and, you know, that seems to be a non-starter with a lot of Republicans. What's your hope for uh, getting some of the state and local uh, aid into the uh, into this uh, next bill? Well, I, I it's so essential. And um, so in terms of uh, on the political politics side of things, I hope every Republican governor is on the phone with uh, the, the senators uh, and and ple er, you know pleading this case. Um, I, when I look at the cuts that are being contemplated in state and local governments at a time when they're being asked to do more because they're uh, on the front lines of fighting the pandemic through public health departments and many other ancillary uh, services. And, uh, you know, just keeping basic services in place uh, and uh, looking at these drastic cuts, uh, it's going to be very harmful um, if, if they don't come around and provide this funding. And frankly, you know, every, every community has to balance its budget. Uh, so uh, that, um, you know, it, it, they're going to be very painful cuts that will also impact our ability to fight the pandemic. Okay, Adrian. There we go. Senator, so um, the White House Coronavirus Task Force is urging 21 states to put more restrictions in place. Wisconsin is in one of these red outbreak zones, according to their map. What do you think our state needs to be doing right now? Well, and of course, the situation in our state is complicated by the fact that the state Supreme Court earlier this year placed um, limits on what uh, statewide public health authorities could uh, order, which was very, very uh, unfortunate in my mind. Um, so in Wisconsin, I'd like to see uh, local officials and local public health officials uh, uh, issuing the best, uh, uh, not just guidance, but, but rules uh, for their local communities. You know, I'm, uh, as I mentioned out here in Washington, DC, there's a mandatory mask order uh, for all of Washington, DC when you're out in public. And uh, I think that's very appropriate to slow the spread uh, since we know that most of it happens when uh, the COVID-19 virus is uh, in the atmosphere and people are uh, interacting. Um, and so I'd like to see that happen. Uh, and um, I think particularly the masks, um, reducing the uh, 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 number and density of uh, uh, people in, um, in businesses that are open right now, um, whether that's you know, the grocery stores of making sure there's not too many people there at once, um, all of those things would be useful in, uh, in trying to create a, a downward trend in our cases in Wisconsin. With a new liberal justice joining the court, do you think that the governor should go ahead and try a statewide mask mandate? Um, I think that uh, we need to evaluate uh, the actions that we can take um, at, any, at, at any level and every level. Um, certainly, uh, it would be better uh, with some of the issues I've been describing if the leadership were coming from uh, the president. Um, but I do think that uh, after that disappointing uh, case in front of the Wisconsin Supreme Court, um, that we should, we should definitely look at trying again. I know when you say leadership coming from the president, would you want a nationwide mask mandate? Well, uh, first of all, uh, not only uh, has he not contemplated that, but until uh, very, very recently flouted the wearing of, of masks. Um, and that was, uh, you know, leadership in part is being a role model and leading by example. And we hadn't seen a mask on, on President Trump until quite recently. Um, that said, uh, at the national level, what I really think they need to do is these OSHA standards that I was talking about um, the Every Worker uh, Protection Act, and uh, to really unlock the full potential of the Defense Production Act for PPE, for uh, testing, all of those things. I mean, we're this far into the pandemic, 
And there is not a national testing strategy that's been articulated by this president or this administration. It's horrifying. Charles? Uh, Senator, you, I want to go back to uh, your saying you have conversations with uh, former Vice President Joe Biden. And one of the things he has added to his um, platform is the Build Back Better, which seems to mirror a lot of things you talk about with Buy American. Uh, but one thing that I saw from the DNC platform committee is that it doesn't look like they're going to go for Medicare for all as one of the uh, voices for that. Uh, are you disappointed? It is not something that uh, the former vice president has bought into. What sort of issues does that create, do you think, uh, for the November election? I know it's only in draft, so I think there still has to be a vote on it. Right, so here's what I would say. The real contrast, the real difference um, is the difference between the parties and uh, the candidates. So. President Trump is in court trying to ask the United States, States Supreme Court to overturn the Affordable Care Act and its protections um, that it provides for people with pre-existing conditions. He has at every turn taken uh, executive action, uh, issuing executive orders to weaken and sabotage the Affordable Care Act. We've seen 5 million people lose their health care since the beginning of this pandemic, and he will not reopen a special enrollment window for the Affordable Care Act marketplace for people to be able to take advantage of getting some coverage that they could afford during a pandemic. And, uh, and, and contrast that with every Democrat who ran in the primary for the presidency, all of them moving in the direction of greater access to high quality affordable care. Um, the uh, variety, I, I know there was a lot of uh, active debate amongst them about which was the best plan. I'll tell you from my perspective, I am all of the above. You'll see my name on most every uh, 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 reform that would strengthen the Affordable Care Act or move us to Medicare for all, uh, create a public option, uh, let Medicare or Medicaid be uh, a, a program that you could buy into before you uh, are otherwise uh, categorically eligible. Um, Democrats stand for increasing access to high quality affordable care and bringing down the price of prescription drugs and making sure that people with pre existing health conditions don't ever get discriminated again. again. But are you disappointed that this is not going to potentially be part of the party's platform? Uh, when you talk about ways to win in Wisconsin, when you talk about uh, those Bernie supporters, uh, where people are and that this is not going to be one of the top issues. Healthcare will certainly be healthcare. One of the I top agree. Issues. Healthcare certainly. But is it a disappointment for you that it does not include Medicare for all? Yeah, well, again, I, I have not read the language, which I regret, uh, have not done so yet. There's um, been some reporting but, on it, so. Yeah, but I do think that, um, it, you know, it came out of a process where uh, uh, some of the former candidates for uh, president, including Bernie Sanders, who's the lead sponsor of Medicare for All, um, was involved. And uh, I just think that, uh, what you, can, what you can trust is that all Democrats that I know uh, uh, are fighting for expansion of access to high quality healthcare and protecting uh, patients from, uh, from insurance abuses uh, that we used to see in the past and protecting people from these junk plans that don't really cover anything. Um, and, and that's what, uh, what the Democratic platform, I hope will make very clear that we're all moving in that direction. Jeff. Okay, Senator, Senator Jeff, uh, Jeff Maris here again. One thing uh, you talked about the lack of leadership from Washington, but one thing that the Trump administration has really stepped into is the whole school reopening debate, urging uh, and even threatening districts that didn't go in person to, uh, um, you know, they, they wouldn't get funds if they didn't. How do you view that? Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, school districts right now in Wisconsin that are struggling with this decision. Uh, your alma mater, UW-Madison, 
uh, has a plan, but it's being criticized. I mean, um, this seems to be a very challenging uh, landscape. And so uh, who who's right, the, the administration approach on this or local decision making? Well, I think it has to be, uh, first of all, science and evidence-based decision making. Uh, and uh, the idea that um, uh, you wouldn't give local control uh, over these issues is, uh, you know, it, it's outrageous to me. Uh, obviously, the virus is um, uh, surging in some areas, uh, not as much uh, uh, in others. And the argument that we're talking about school children, so it's less dangerous, uh, what about teachers? What about uh, school staff? What about uh, the parents or grandparents that these children uh, might carry the virus back to? Uh, these are things that appear not to have been even considered. This doesn't seem to be a uh, rational science-based uh, initiative by uh, President Trump and Secretary Betsy DeVos. Um, it appears to be uh, much more uh, focused on, uh, uh, you know, the election perhaps. But that's not how decisions should be made during a pandemic. Could this issue end up uh, in, the, in the big coronavirus bill that's being debated or being negotiated? Well, I'll tell you what uh, was introduced uh, at the beginning of the week, the Republican version of this, um, holds uh, two thirds of what education funding they did have in it hostage to schools uh, uh, reopening. So unless they reopen, uh, they would be deprived of uh, the uh, funding that is included. Um, a third, uh, I think a third of it would be available to all schools regardless. But I will say that for those who feel they have to do um, additional remote uh, uh, online learning, the dollars are needed there too. Uh, it is um, not only expensive to reopen and figure out how to make a classroom that had 30 uh, now hold 10 and how do you get in the additional instructional staff when you make these classrooms smaller in terms of the number of pupils, but it's also expensive to make sure that um, people who uh, live in areas that are not served by high-speed internet um, can have access to both devices and, um, and high-speed broadband in order to complete classes and complete homework. And so all of that is going to need funding and the Republican bill uh, is totally inadequate to meet uh, either of those needs. Well, that doesn't seem likely to survive, does it? I mean, that seems to be like a negotiating tactic. Well, the, um, the, the Senate Democrats have uh, endorsed a bill called the Coronavirus Child Care and Education Recovery Act, which um, it relied on expert advice, uh, both in terms of um, uh, sort of how, uh, what's the real uh, dollar need in order to do all of these things and particularly in childcare, which I don't think we talk enough about, but as the economy reopens, many people will be, de be dependent on needing a safe place for their children who are preschool. Um, a lot of uh, childcare businesses haven't made it through this pandemic and won't reopen. Others will be uh, needing to reopen with smaller numbers of children and uh, therefore uh, you know, questionable whether they can make ends meet. Uh, and so we have a real crisis also uh, in the childcare arena uh, that's forthcoming that we need to address in this coronavirus package. Okay, on to you, Adrian. Sorry, I hogged up those questions. No, no worries. Interesting stuff here. So we appreciate that. I wanted to make sure to get in one last question for you, Senator Baldwin. So some Democrats seem to be accusing Senator Ron Johnson of potentially using Russian propaganda to interfere with the 2020 election. I'm wondering what your level of concern is about that and if you want the FBI to look into it. Well, um, I, 
I can't comment specifically on that uh, issue, um, but I can say that I have uh, every reason to believe that we continue to experience foreign interference with our elections, um, just as we did uh, uh, in 2016. Uh, the intelligence agencies, um, uh, I think, are, are unanimous in saying that uh, we are continuing to have uh, foreign interference. It takes all sorts of different forms. And I can say that um, uh, some of the ways have changed since uh, four years ago, uh, but, um, but there is uh, definitely, uh, definitely foreign interference and we, we have to be wary and we have to have our eyes open. And why can't you comment specifically about Senator Ron Johnson's potential involvement? Um, I, I have uh, I reviewed classified material and I can't talk about it. I'm gonna hop in at this point, uh, participants, with questions from those who have been watching and listening in at home or at work. Uh, Senator, question, do you support efforts in Milwaukee, Madison, and other cities throughout the nation to take money and staffing away from police departments and spend it instead on community and social services? In other words, defund police. Um, I do not support defunding the police, but I also think it's important for all of us to really sort of unpack what was meant by uh, that phrase. It's meant to be provocative, you know, it's a slogan, but um, I think that we place a lot of responsibilities and burdens on the shoulders of police officers that really go beyond uh, promoting public safety and fighting crime. Uh, we have decided a long time ago in, um, in America and in Wisconsin uh, to sort of uh, use a criminal model to address uh, certain social problems that in other parts of the world they've used a healthcare model. Uh, particularly with regard to issues of serious mental illness and with regard to issues of uh, substance abuse, uh, uh, whether that's uh, alcohol or, uh, or uh, other drugs. And um, I do think uh, that it is important for communities to reevaluate what safety means and who uh, needs to be performing uh, particular functions. But you know, this, this provocative phrase, um, I, I think that if somebody's breaking into your house, we need to be able to call 911 and know that uh, uh, our police are, are uh, funded to respond and respected for uh, what they do. Uh, we also very much need to look at um, the consequences of, of the way we've set up um, and the expect expectations that we've placed on uh, police officers uh, where we have, uh, as you referenced in, in your question, um, uh, underfunded efforts to uh, uh, deal with these uh, really uh, horrible issues um, you know, that, that impact uh, families and communities. Um, with a healthcare uh, model. Someone else taking part today would like to know, uh, they say they are concerned about the vast divisions between the two political parties. What can be done to bridge this divide? Oh gosh, there's so, so much. Um, so, uh, you know, and I, I remember early on in um, my uh, time in elective office uh, when uh, the partisanship was much reduced. And uh, I think there's all sorts of factors that have led to uh, the heightened uh, partisanship. Um, but if I were to uh, sort of suggest the, the, the path forward, um, first of all, I think that it would be helpful uh, if the leaders of various legislative uh, branches, the leaders of the party in each of these branches, whether it's state level or national level, sort of agree uh, uh, that not every issue that comes has to be uh, a partisan issue. There was a day when our transportation infrastructure bills were 
thoroughly bipartisan. Uh, still on the Senate Appropriations Committee, most of our bills pass unanimously out of each of the subcommittees. There's a way for this to happen. Um, and uh, I, I think that that would be a step forward. I do think, um, since I'm talking to a bunch of folks from media, uh, that I um, would say that uh, the, the move to uh, you know, social media, media platforms as well as 24 seven uh, news shows, et cetera, um, has led to uh, a lot more um, uh, opportunities for people to say things they might later regret and then the records are there. So, uh, you know, people want to be rebooked on a show or something like that. So they kind of uh, can become a little bit edgy. Uh, and I do think that um, uh, we need more formats like, like this for uh, thoughtful conversations that aren't finger pointing, that aren't name calling. You know, I've been pretty tough on President Trump, uh, but I hope I've been substantive about why uh, I've said those, you know, those things. Uh, but I, I do think that, um, I, that we have, it's, it's gonna be very hard to put that genie back in the bottle, if you will, but we can do it. Senator Baldwin, our hour is almost up. We thank you very much for your time today and your participation. Thanks as well to our panel of journalists, that being Charles Benson of TMJ4, Jeff Mayers, our partner at wispolitics.com, and Adrian Pedersen of WISN Channel 12. Thanks as well to our sponsors, including Spectrum News One and our sustaining sponsor, Miller Cost, and Wiz Politics, our partner, along with the Rotary. And uh, with politics partners that include UW Milwaukee, Wisconsin Academy of Global Education and Training, 1125 at PAPS, the Milwaukee Police Association, the firm Consulting, the Medical College of Wisconsin, and Spectrum. We have a busy week next week, Tuesday. Milwaukee Police Chief Alfonso Morales joins us for another noon newsmaker event. It will be virtual. He will be accompanied by his attorney, Franklin Gimbel. It's deadline approaching for those 11 directives. Alfonso Morales and Franklin Gimbel will discuss those with us at noon on Tuesday, Wednesday. Another newsmaker event virtual with Milwaukee County Board Chairman Arcelia Nicholson. So please go to our website, find out how you can be part of those events. And again, uh, the tip jar is always there too on top of our piano. If you'd like to leave a buck or two, that help us with our missions for endowment and also for uh, furthering our projects here at the Milwaukee Press Club. Just go to milwaukeepressclub.org, milwaukeepressclub.org. Got to get the address right so you know where to put that money. And uh, thanks for anything you can do for that. Thanks to everybody for watching and listening today. Thanks to our participants once again, especially Senator Danny Baldwin. And we'll see you next week for those two newsmaker virtual events. Take care, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Bye.